Hi guys, Tony here. In this week's episode, I'm talking with True Diagnostics founder Ryan Smith about why NAD testing is so important. And we're talking about precursors like MNN and, and how they relate to uh, biological aging. We're also going to be talking about the biological clock and why it's so important in relation to your health. Following this episode, I'm going to be doing an update test which will track all the changes I've made in these approximately last five months. Once I get my results during December, I'll be doing an update session with Ryan, just reviewing all the interventions I've made and just seeing what's taken place. Um, okay. So I'm going to be doing like an NAD test. I mentioned to them they're bringing that on board, but um, it's because I've started doing five amino one MQ, and yeah, uh, uh, I've noticed like it's um, it's actually I was going to ask it's quite powerful, like uh, compared to like MNN. Like I really I've started yeah. doing um, high amounts of uh, loads of uh, parsley rather than taking apigenin. I was taking yeah, like, just having a lot of parsley because I've because re- it's my gut microbiome really it's really one one of the a really good prebiotic yeah. for me so killing two birds yeah. one stone and then but i'm noticing with yeah i'm not testing my nad levels but i feel a difference for sure yeah definitely and, and so i can tell you that we do nad testing here i'm um, using the nad med kit um and uh we do see uh nad levels increase with one of uh, the five amino one mq um and so we certainly see it with nad precursors but we don't see it with nad iv injections um or subcutaneous injections um and so it, it looks like you might need a precursor to really raise those intracellular levels mm. yeah yeah because yeah. i've tried um i did it i am and, and subcutaneously uh, NAD mm-hmm. and then I yeah I didn't get the same results from it so you know yeah. that's what I'm hearing is there's a uh, PhD doctor uh, Nicola you heard of yeah, it yeah I know you're talking about yeah yeah um, N- Nuchido or I think so yeah, yeah Nuchido it is yeah yeah, yeah. and then she, she's saying is basically if you give M and N it's like an equivalent you're giving more raw materials you've got a factory that's not working properly it's a good analogy so you're just giving them more Definitely. materials, but then machines aren't working properly. So you're not necessarily, you might increase production at, to a level, but this machines aren't still working. So it's about, you know, increasing that exactly. efficiency. So, yeah. I'm happy to announce Nicola will be on the channel next week. If you just use a supplement such as NR or NMN, a precursor-based supplement, the precursor goes into the cell. It does get converted into NAD, which is why you see um, companies that produce these um, molecules show around a 60% increase in NAD boost with these supplements. So you do get an increase in NAD, but this NAD is then used up and it's broken down. And as soon as it's broken down, it's converted into nicotinamide. And if you haven't fixed the underlying problems in the cell, which are causing NAD to decline, namely this reduction in the salvage pathway because of this enzyme that's declined with age, what happens is the cell has to get rid of it. So it methylates it and it excretes it. Definitely. No, and in the five amino one MQ does something a little bit similar, right? Where you know you're blocking the uh, the conversion outside to one methyl nicotinamide, yeah. so you're, you're going to create more NMN and, and then more NAD. Um, so yeah, similar similar uh, uh, output. Yeah, because you've you've done it before, haven't you? You've I think you've talked about. It before. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah big big fan uh, of yeah. my personal experience. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I'd, I'd be interested to see, yeah, see my NAD levels. I mean, because that's something surely if you've got healthy NAD levels and that probably reflects it over time anyway in your um, epigenetic age. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I should say we don't know yet. We haven't seen uh, mm-hmm. a connection, but that is certainly, I would say, dysfunctions in NAD and mitochondria um, certainly would make sense as something to, to, I would say, increase that aging process. Mm. Oh, yeah, and you were saying about sodium levels, um, because I actually saw an interesting study where they uh, reduced the levels of blood glucose and sodium levels. And then the combination of the two of them, they had a 70 fold increase in white oh, wow. blood cell mitochondria, which is great. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, never, I haven't seen that study, but that, I mean, that uh, certainly sounds impressive. Mm, yeah. So you think that's why, like, so people, if they've got like a highly processed diet full of salt and sugar and uh, fats, whatever, like, and then you think that's why they're probably the likelihood of them having uh you know mitochondrial issues or even even long covid's probably higher i imagine and all these kind of things 
Oh, certainly. I, yeah, I mean, there, there, obviously, you know, many things that can drive that mitochondrial issue, um, but you know, including aging itself, where we even get, you know, from stress or, or even those inflammatory markers, we oxidize even the cardiolipin uh, in the membrane, which is leads to my favorite uh, peptide, which is that SS thirty one, which yeah, is you yeah. know great for mitochondrial yeah. function. Yeah, that's right. Because I because I've haven't done I've, I've done Motsi previously, but I've not haven't tried yeah. that one. And I mean, what you're saying, what is it? That stat is one one shot of it's like the equivalent of six months worth of doing regular cardio yeah daily endurance training exercise yeah. from an atp equivalent that is wow. okay so that one i think because we talked about the previous if i remember right so it's the yeah. equivalent of um because it's maybe better for someone say if you've got your mitochondria is because what the mitochondria drive pept on mozzi is probably leaning more towards someone who's overweight or a bit older maybe would you say yeah well i think that generally they've seen the you know the um you know, Matsi is goes down in, in people who are, you know, generally overweight. And so that supplement narrative tends to make sense. But, you know, as we age, all of us are oxidizing our mitochondrial membrane structures and they get looser and less effective. And we really want them tight and compact so that the electron transport chain is super efficient. And that's really what the SS31 does. Hmm. But yeah, it's interesting, you know, just uh, having increased NAD levels, even my libido is like noticeably like increased and like, mm -hmm. And you think it would oh, be really? high, and, yeah, because yeah, I'd be like on TRT. But then I, I think yeah. there's, there's so many things are linked to uh, your energy, you know, because it could even improve your mood. Like that's what I say, NAD mm -hmm. can actually having healthy NAD yeah. levels can even yeah improve so many things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And, and, you know, it's just so fundamental, right? Mitochondria are important in every cell in the body for every process. And so if you're, you know, it's, it's one of those things that can go a long way. With our omic age calculator, we are 92% accurate within a period of 10 years, which is you know much better than chronological age alone, and really capturing that process, which obviously ultimately leads to uh, you know uh, longevity. So, um, so, so again, I think that this is a really good metric, and that's one of the ways we would score it. Um, by 92%. Saying how predictive it actually is. Correct. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, was it Gary Brecker where? Yeah, <laughs> he talks about predicting to the month and uh, using insurance data. If you don't do what we're going to ask you to do for the next 10 weeks, do you have a life expectancy of 10.4 years? No chance um, uh, at all. Uh, there, yeah, there's there's just no chance. Uh, the best things that are published in the literature, um, you know, uh, are, are are accurate uh, uh, with with much much lower certainty. Because mm, I was wondering how he even calculate that because obviously it's not just epigenetics he's probably he must be looking at all kinds of metrics but then obviously it's still it's still like a a guesstimate isn't it yeah. i mean it's obviously he's looking at data and you know it's, it's not accurate in that um yes yeah, it's, it's yeah i'm sure it's accurate but obviously not to like really talking to that level it's just uh you can't yeah yeah you know, there, there have been a couple of people who have done some interesting models. Uh, so like even, for instance, Google's, uh, some of their their companies uh, have used things like driving speed data um, and all the things that happen as you, you know, collect data from a massive company like Google. And, and they still are not that predictive. Um, and so uh, no matter what, I would say what data set you're looking at, I think epigenetics tends to be pretty good at predicting mortality, mm -hmm. um, way so than even blood-based biomarkers or, you know, other things. Uh, so, uh, so again, I, I tend to be highly skeptical of anyone who says they can predict it even within a year uh, or even yeah. two years. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that would be incredible, um, let alone a month. <laughs> yeah. And I know Peter Atia, he's, he's, he's more, he's not, I was talking to Hannah about this actually, and he's not, he's not so keen on epigenetic tests, but he said, you're, He's trying to kind of organize a podcast with him because you know it's um he maybe he's looking at old data and um because i think he's keener on using blood work as a kind of predictor mm -hmm. of um mortality rather than epigenetics but um obviously there's you know the, the clocks are getting more and more sophisticated aren't they so yeah exactly yeah and i think um yeah looking at um so you're saying 92 percent accurate because that's something i think because like I was looking, investigating, you know, health span calculators and things like that. And, you know, on the internet, but they're obviously they're not, they're very, very generic, aren't they? That's the thing. So 
Mm-hmm. It's um, I mean, look at this. It's really is like a you know a health span calculator when you look at all the combined clock the reports together. Yeah, exactly. And so that's actually how we trained the list originally is we, we trained it with blood based biomarkers. Um, and then we we sort of uh, used that to create a death prediction. And then we trained methylation to predict that death prediction. Um, and so that way, we had sort of the best of both worlds, both clinical biomarkers, as well as overall biomarkers, but it, we informed it with all the other methylation technology by specifically creating methylation algorithms to represent all of those other measurements. Um, so that was sort of the idea and philosophy is to get everything we can all in one measure. Mm. Yeah. And so the omic age, is that something would you, if you so you'd focus more on that than on the uh, intrinsic epigenetic age now? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, it is way more predictive of most healthcare outcomes. OK. And you're still going to be so when people do a new test, obviously, that'll still be there as a comparison to your old one. Yeah, and, and we, we so include it, uh, but but we never recommend making sort of treatment decisions based off of it. Um, and just to reiterate why a little bit, um, you know, it goes back to those first generation clocks don't always behave correctly. Um, and they give us sometimes really bad information, um, you know, versus good information. So, you know, the case example we always talk about, again, is that caloric restriction study, because caloric restriction is one of the most well-validated therapies for, uh, for lifespan and health span increase particularly in a lot of animals as well as in humans. Um, And here we saw the first generation clocks went up, uh, which we know is not probably correct. Um, So giving us maybe bad information. We also saw this with our senolytic interventions, as I mentioned earlier, where the first generation clocks went up with senolytics, whereas the second and third generation clocks, the ones we trust a lot more, trained to predict that biology of aging, showed so maybe some negative change, but not even close to significance. Um, and so again, those first generation clocks, like even our intrinsic and extrinsic, are just outdated. And, and quite frankly, I wouldn't use them. They're meant to tell you someone's chronological age, not not really trained to the biology of what's actually happening in your right. body okay. as we age. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I know, obviously, there's a lot of noise with some of them. Um, I know mm-hmm. Elysium, I was listening to that, where they, they brought someone on board to really try and uh try and cancel out the noise the methylation noise and i'm I'm guessing moodoo health do the same because from what i've heard they use your chronological age as a kind of calibrator to to normalize the the data yeah and and we and we traditionally find that that again doesn't work very well because you're already biasing the data based on someone's chronological age which is really again not what we want to see um but but yeah you know the way we measure precision is by if we take the same sample multiple times how close is that value to all the other values we we, ideally we want it to be identical right so we take one sample tested five times we always get the same age but that doesn't always happen especially with some of these early clocks so we always like to talk about the clocks which have been published and and so in history there are really only you know a couple that that generally are published the Dunedin Pace Grim Age, Pheno Age, uh, Horvath and Hannum. Those usually five are the ones we talk about. Now there are more with our omic age um, as well as the systems age clock from Yale Um, but uh, these are usually the ones that are reported on the most and you can see early replicates you know oftentimes could be you know 50 percent different from another metric um, and that's really not good so what you want to see now is that icc values are, are very high and our iccs for this algorithm are 0.995 meaning that if we test the same sample multiple times there's less than a 0.5 percent variation across those different tests uh which is excellent that is extremely extremely precise okay and so obviously doing saliva i know because steve horvath was saying it's not it's not really accurate enough for um, methylation data and so that has an impact on the you know you're being able to get that um you know 0.95 exactly uh, well the other you know you could probably certainly get that type of accuracy with saliva but the problem is algorithms created in saliva don't make a lot of sense because we can't see their outcomes. Um, so one of the biggest things, you know, whenever we did this trial, we had to select samples that had been taken 40 years ago. And the oh, reason like for the that is, data. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah, is we actually know what happened to those patients. The problem is no one really biobanks saliva um, right. to see what actually happens yeah, to those yeah. outcomes. So even if you have a great algorithm in saliva, you can't prove it um, because mm. you can't actually see those outcomes. So that's why everyone uses blood is because it's something that biobanks and medical systems have banked for a long time. Um, and so you can give some really good information on it. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I don't think there's not really... 
apart from Moodoo Health, I mean, there's not really many um, uh, epigenetic testing companies in the UK. And I think the reason why they do saliva from what they've told me is down to because um, people are used to doing it for COVID tests. So mm -hmm. just to make it as user friendly as possible. But then if you're sacrificing yeah. the quality of your data, then surely what's the point? Yeah. You know? Exactly. And, and that's why we've stuck with uh, with blood based algorithms only. But we are creating methods to get it into saliva. Um, and the only way to do that is to create correction algorithms where you're taking, you know, buccal cells, sal saliva and blood all at the same time. And then uh, seeing what type of overlap there is or consistencies among the multiple data sets. Check out the link in the pinned comment down below for the True Age Complete Test. It's the most advanced biological age test ever created. A great insight into your health. Think of the True Age Pace as an intermediate test, so all those positive changes you've made since doing your complete, you can check in to see how your body is responding. And the reason why my company Epic Genetics is the most competitively priced is we don't pay to advertise. So it's all thanks to you guys watching. Thanks for watching. See you next time.